In Japanese mythology, an Anria was a person forced into an unjust death that returns in spiritual form to exact revenge on the living. The myth can be traced back to the Nara period of ancient Japan, between 710 and 794 AD, in which it was believed the spirits would return to seek revenge for their often gruesome deaths. Fast forward to the early 2000s, and the United States sees an infusion of Japanese pop culture into its own, specifically with regards to horror. Japanese movies like The Grudge and The Ring began a trend of American Japanese horror remakes that endured for more than a decade, and once again, the Onryo's infamous draped black hair and pale skin saw cultural life. Sadako, or Samara, the main antagonist of The Ring, is perhaps the best known contemporary example of an Onryo. Video games were not immune to this cultural infusion. Western audiences had been inundated with Japanese horror for a while. Franchises like Resident Evil and Silent Hill setting a gold standard for horror gaming as far back as the late 90s. In 2005, one of gaming's more infamous Onryos, Alma, made her first appearance in Fear. Developed by Monolith Productions, Fear combines tried and true action game mechanics, some almost as old as the genre itself, with psychological hallucinogenic horror into a game that, for its time, I don't think there is a whole lot of precedent. In a 2005 interview with Eurogamer, then Monolith lead designer Craig Hubbard said the team wanted to make the player feel like an action movie hero. You don't just want to defeat your enemies, you want to do it with style. That might sound like a superficial distinction, but it's crucial. Presentation is key. Fear, for my money, is the greatest action horror game ever made, and this is partially due to the brilliant job Monolith does nailing that action movie feeling. Monolith prioritizes control over speed, and as a result, you'll notice player speed isn't all that fast, but this gives combat weight. Enemies violently recoil on hit, and environments are beautifully malleable shattering and scarring from gunfire and explosions. While far from the first game to use it, fear slows down combat with bullet time, and the mechanic is implemented to near perfection. Alongside challenging, aggressive AI, fear's combat remains one of the most visually and tangibly satisfying systems I've ever played. And it's all contained within a classic, almost retro structure. Health packs are scattered throughout levels, as is armor that'll soften the blow of attacks. Your bullet time meter and health can be upgraded by finding hidden boosts, and weapons, of which you can carry three, range from more grounded pistols and assault rifles to rocket launchers and particle rifles. When you watch an action movie like John Woo's Hard Boiled, it's the filmmaker that dictates tempo and choreography. The audience is a passive observer along for the ride. In Fear, you dictate the tempo and choreography. Bullet time and real time exist as two interactive styles of gameplay that work on different mechanical levels. In real time, you'll need to move more carefully, take your time, lean out of cover, and watch your flanks. Bullet time allows you to be more aggressive. You'll plan attacks seconds in advance and better react to fear's excellent AI, an AI that will maneuver against you, give themselves covering fire, and knock over objects for cover. The AI is also loud, they communicate, scream orders, and occasionally count the number of squad mates you've killed. Enemies often announce their presence when entering rooms, allowing you to execute quick impromptu ambushes or get a grenade off before a firefight starts. Monolith wants you to react but not to plan, to pounce and fight on the fly. The Combat's kept fresh, with heavily armored mechs, invisible soldiers, and other enemies that make bullet time more of a commodity than just a fun mechanic. There's even a surprisingly useful hand-to-hand -hand combat system in Fear 2. With the little damage resistance players already have, getting close to an enemy usually does more harm than good, but it can help you out in a pinch or during the flow of a fight. You can jump and scissor kick enemies, or slide into them to knock them down, even holster your weapon and come at guys swinging. It's definitely better saved as a last resort thing, but effectively drives home that feeling of an action hero improvising their way through a group of bad guys. If you stitched together Fear's combat sections, you'd think you were playing a mindless, albeit phenomenal, arena shooter. But what really sets Fear apart from its horror counterparts is its expert pacing. 
Whereas horror often immerses you in constant tension and stress, fear flawlessly weaves slower, darker sequences of terror in and out of its intense, raucous combat, and it usually happens without warning. You never know what's around the corner when you'll be thrown into a chilling hallucination. It's this pacing that makes fear's horror so potent. One minute you're tearing through bad guys like a badass, and then a few minutes later the level suddenly slows, your flashlight and HUD blink and you're subject to visions, some of which are story sequences and other times become a kind of paranormal combat. Fear carefully builds tension and delicately delivers its scares. Jump scares are meaningful and not overdone, and much of the story is told via hallucinations, all of which are pieces to a terrifying and well-written puzzle. Fear is a story of atonement and sorrow, of hubris and revenge. You play as a silent protagonist known only as Point Man, the newest member of First Encounter Assault Recon, also known as Fear. Conceptually, the group is like a Ghostbusters Rainbow Six hybrid, though the story Fear tells is much more interpersonal, character driven even. Monolith never dives into the organizational structure, politics, or details of how Fear actually operates. We're mostly just left with the fact that we're a part of it. There's nothing intrinsically wrong with the story Monolith wants to tell, but I would have loved a little more explanation behind how Fear operates as a military unit. Fear begins by introducing our two main antagonists, Alma and the cannibalistic Paxton. Fettel, with Alma releasing Fettel from a dreary jail cell. Soon after, you arrive at a fear mission briefing explaining that Fettel, who was property of Armacam Technology Corporation, a weapons manufacturer, has telepathically taken control of an army of clones super soldiers, and it's Fear's job to stop him. Progressing through Fear's levels, you pursue Fettel, investigating why he's doing what he's doing, while both he and Alma hunt and harass you along the way. The bulk of the story is told through three techniques, loading screens, hallucinations, and voice recordings and laptops. Loading screens keep you updated on current events, hallucinations hint at Fear's grander plot twist, and laptops and voicemails build the world around you and reveal many of Fear's important plot points. Fear's story is well written, but it can be easy to get lost. There's no way to go back and listen to old voicemails or laptop entries, and you'll also need to be sure there aren't any enemies around when you find them around levels. Loading screens are of the standard exposition saturation type, though they do a nice job keeping you updated and even use an interesting strict military vernacular, including some military acronyms. They're somewhat reminiscent of the old Modern Warfare loading screens with writing straight out of a Metal Gear Solid codec conversation. And they stay that way too. Even as you witness more and more paranormal activity and fear, loading screens read unattached, almost encouraging players to second guess the things they see. It's a conscious contradiction that I think adds to fear's overall horror. You feel like the only person experiencing the paranormal, seeing ghosts and hallucinations. Even within this limited framework, Monolith was still able to give Fear a story I'd wager is and was better than your average FPS. Voicemails, for instance, are preceded by which character is talking. This isn't only useful for organizing who is who, but also does an effective job fleshing out the personalities of important characters. No example of this characterization is better than the conflict between two Armacam executives, Harlan Wade, a character you will encounter, and Genevieve Aristide, a character you never actually meet. As you rummage through Armacam office buildings in pursuit of Fettel, you'll run across their communications with employees and each other. Fettel's escape and subsequent takeover of the company's clone military pit Aristide and Wade into a corporate struggle, each maneuvering to shift blame and end the crisis on their terms. Hey, Phil, it's Harlan. I'll tell you straight up, that I'll be fucked if her or any one of her little toadies is going anywhere near the vault. She already caused enough damage thinking she could just march in there and start over from scratch. If she comes to you for backup, remind her that we've locked that place up for a reason. Phil, how are you? It's Genevieve. I haven't seen you at Maurice's lately. We should get together for happy hour once this mess blows over. Oh, speaking of which, I have a favor to ask. I know you and Harlan go back a ways, so I was hoping you could try to reason with him. He refuses to forgive me for sending those poor people into the vault, as though I'm happy about what happened. I made a mistake, but I don't see why everyone else should have to pay for that. Anything you can say to get him to see reason would be appreciated. 
Of course, as you progress through the story, a bigger twist unfolds. Eventually, you uncover that Alma is an Armacam experiment herself, used for her psychic ability, and that she not only gave birth to Fettel, but Pointman as well. Pointman and his talents in combat were the result of Project Origin, a secret experiment by Armacam to create psychic military commanders. Toward Fear's End, your adventure takes you down into a secret underground research facility, where Armacam still holds Alma Alma's physical body and are tasked with destroying it. You kill Fettel, but before you're able to destroy the lab and escape, Wade, filled with remorse over the way he and Armacam abused Alma, frees her from captivity, where she promptly takes revenge. As you exit the facility, it detonates, decimating a large portion of the surface habited by an abandoned city. You seem to get away scot-free until Alma climbs onto the helicopter you're escaping in and fear cuts to black. It's an ominous and uncertain conclusion, highlighted by by a post credit scene where Aristide, who has survived the game's events, hence Point Man may have been doing the company's bidding the entire time. Senator, it's Genevieve Aristide. I just wanted to assure you that the origin situation has been resolved. But so much for discretion. It was unavoidable. There is some good news, however. The first prototype was a complete success. Fear was followed up by two expansions, Extraction Point and Perseus Mandate, both developed by the now defunct TimeGate Studios. While both expand on the events of Fear, TimeGate largely fails to uphold Monolith's brilliant pacing. The gameplay itself remains relatively clean, but Fear's interesting storytelling and well-executed horror drop off in both Extraction Point and Perseus Mandate. Extraction Point picks up where Fear left off, following Point Man as he tries to regroup with his colleagues and escape the Blast Zone. Alma can continues to hunt him, as does Fettel, who returns to life through some pretty uninspired writing. I know it doesn't make sense. Not much does anymore. You killed me. I didn't like that. Perseus Mandate, released after Extraction Point, follows a completely different Fear team, headed by another silent protagonist known only as Sergeant. It coincides with the events of Fear and Extraction Point, but has little to do with Point Man. Perseus Mandate also pivots towards more conventional storytelling, including cinematics, more characters and dialogue. New bad guys are introduced, a mercenary organization known as the Nightcrawlers attempting to save Alma's DNA, assumingly to use it for themselves. Sergeant ultimately does stop them, taking the DNA for himself, but it's revealed that the Nightcrawler secretly made it out with Fettel's DNA in the post credit scene. It's important to note that neither Perseus Mandate or Extraction Point are considered canon. Timegate had apparently taken Fear's story in a direction Monolith hadn't intended, and Fear's sequels don't reflect either of the expansion's events, which I've always found a little disappointing. Perseus Mandate told a separate standalone story that ended with some serious sequel bait, and Extraction Point adds little to the stage that fear set. But there is one aspect of Extraction Point I've always thought was actually really interesting, even if it takes some interpretation. At the end of Fear, once Point Man has set the Armacam lab to explode and his parentage revealed, Alma speaks to him, saying, This indicates Alma wasn't aware Point Man was her son, just like Point Man wasn't aware Alma was his mother until the very end. In what is Extraction Point's biggest redeeming quality, we see the effects of this realization. Throughout each game, Alma appears in two forms, as a child and as an adult. In Extraction Point, instead of haunting Point Man, her child form actually helps him. She kills soldiers in his way, even showing you the way out of a level if you're lost. Her adult form, however, still haunts Point Man and accounts for most of the scares. This continues until the very end, when an elevator Point Man is supposed to take to the end of the game falls to the bottom floor of a hospital. Before entering the elevator, you can see Alma walk in herself and wait for you. The bottom floor is soaked with blood, lights are flickering, and it's all pretty creepy. Once you've reached the morgue, Alma triggers a hallucination of what seems to be an asylum. You move through, taking out a few ghosts and witnessing some creepy visions along the way. You eventually reach a hallway of holding cells, inside of which are characters Alma has killed or had a part in killing. Not too long after, you're led down a similar hallway where this happens.
Alma's child form and adult form meet in a blue light, and the music afterward changes from creepy to nearly alleviating. So why would the music be like this? What did players do? The thing is, it's not what players did, it's what they experienced. Alma isn't totally evil, she's sorrowful, filled with an uncontrollable bitterness and shame for what she's done and become. She carries the weight of those she's killed with her and wants her son to understand that. And while she's still pretty twisted, there's an innocence there, a child who never got a chance to live. Her two forms merging is an admission of guilt. She renounces her dual identities, conjoining them and confronting the terror she's become. When you wake up from the hallucination, the room is clean and the elevator is inexplicably repaired. Once on the roof, your escape helicopter explodes, presumably by Fettel's doing. Extraction Point ends making Fettel, not Alma, out to be the real villain, a source of irredeemable evil. A war is coming. I've seen it in my dreams. Fire sweeping over the earth. Bodies in the streets. Cities turned to dust. Retaliation. Of course, we'll never really know if Fettel's words harbored any real meaning. Extraction Point never saw a direct sequel and most likely never will, as Fear 2 and 3 took the series in a different direction. Fear is by far my favorite horror game. It's a combination of paranormal Japanese-inspired terror dressed in the fabric of a fantastic arena shooter works incredibly well, was unique for its day, and even today remains a style rarely recreated, if ever. And I'd go so far as to even consider it one of the greatest horror games ever made. Thank you.